thought I would start by uh, saying a little bit about what is gel, uh, what are we doing here, and what are we doing here this year? Uh, I started gel in 2003 with the first event, so we have rented almost every year since. Uh, this is the 14th gel event. Uh, we've, we've run it every year except for two, but two years we doubled up. So 14 years, on average, one a year since 2003. And my founding vision in 2003 is re really still uh, present um, in the event, which is that gel is an opportunity to explore good experience in all its forms. Now, in 2003, that was kind of an unusual, radical suggestion. People say, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean experience? What was this experience you keep talking about? Well, now in 2016, I mean, it seems like everything's an experience. Like, we, we want to provide you the best patient experience possible. Or we hope you have a great traveler experience at the airport. Or your dining experience is important to us. Like, everyone's talking about experience all the time. So that's, that's pretty easy to, um, to convince people uh, of. But um, the, the question is, how do we create a good experience. What are the aspects of a good experience versus the not so good experiences? Because the, what's, what's, uh, what I've found since 2003 is that the, the people and the teams and the organizations that have focused on a good experience over the years have turned out to be the winners, the leaders in their industries and the ones who've built lasting successes. And so what I've tried to do over the years is have speakers from every conceivable discipline and approach and background come on stage and talk to us about some experience that they've created or that they manage. And the, uh, the diversity has really, um, I, I'm just very proud of the diversity that, that we've been able to bring together. I wrote down some of the fields of uh, study or, or work of some of our speakers. We've had speakers from technology, education, retail, architecture, farming. It turns out plants need a good experience, too. <laughs> Psychology, music, number of musical performances over the years, healthcare, sculpture, history, and game design. We had some last year, uh, among others. And all in, in all of those fields, we keep seeing patterns of Good experience, how do we think about what someone else uh, wants from us? How do we empathize with the, the people or the constituents that we're serving? And what I have concluded now in the 14th event is that all of us are in the experience business now. Some of us actually have experience in our job titles, user experience architect or something, but even if that's not specifically part of your job, all of us are tasked with creating some experience for someone else or some other group of people. And as I said, it's better to know how to create a good experience than not. So thank you for being with us. Um, the speakers that we've had from all of those different disciplines over the years, I've tried to group every year into uh, a theme of some sort to provide kind of a loose frame for, for that year's lineup. And that, the, the theme lineup has also been um, very diverse. We've, we've had hidden potential as one of our themes, food and spirit, back to life, primary sources, breaking barriers, and uh, last year was uh, impact. We had some great talks uh, last year. And this year, our theme, as you saw in the, the video, the short video there, uh, our theme this year is journey. And I've been thinking about this theme since the, the last gel, so I've been working on this for about a year, and I, I've reflected on it a lot that uh, journeys often represent a very good experience, a very deeply good experience in the way that good experiences can and should be meaningful and authentic. And the idea of a journey has been part of uh, Human, human history and literature for, for thousands of years, so I thought it would be really um, uh, appropriate and interesting and relevant to explore that this year. Um, so Journey is our theme. I wanted to, but, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the reading that I've done in the past year to, um, to, to explore this theme myself a little bit, but before I do, just as a side note, for any of you who work in a user experience field, I want to go ahead and give a hat tip and get it over with. 
and the, you know where I'm probably where I'm headed with this. In the last few years, one of the most popular uh, tactical diagramming tools that has become very popular and talked about is called the journey map. And this is a journey map. So now, we've all seen a journey map. We don't have to do this anymore for the rest of the day, right? <laughs> so when you go back to the office and the boss asks, uh, what did you do with that uh, crazy gel conference over there? You can say, oh, we just looked at journey maps all day. And so we learned how to do journey map. Very good, very good. Well, I'm glad I approved that budget. So yes, <laughs> take a photo of this so it looks like we're all studying journey maps. The, the theme was journey, and look, and we did the squiggly lines and everything. Okay, everybody got your photos? All right, can we move on now? Now let's talk about real journeys, because <laughs> I think that's where the significance lies. And as I said, for, for thousands of years, humans have been telling stories about journeys Here's three that might immediately come to mind. I'm sure many of you have, have read some or all of these. I've read parts of them. So we've got the Divine Comedy, obviously the Odyssey. You've got to have the Odyssey and the Canterbury Tales. And these are just in the Western canon. I mean, all world literature has, has stories of journeys. Um, and so as I said, I, I put some time into uh, doing some reading over the last year uh, to, uh, to explore the theme in preparation for today. And I read, uh, I read a number of books, but, but two were really long and significant to me, and I'll, I'll show them to you now. The first was a book called The Journey to the West, which is a, a masterpiece of Chinese literature. It was written about 500 years ago. Uh, four volumes, the whole thing's about 1,500 pages. It took me a long time uh, to get through, but, but well worth it. This, this is, if you don't know, this is the story of a Buddhist monk, he's the guy seated in the white robe on the left, who has to travel from China, to walk from China to India in a westward direction, hence the name Journey to the West, to um, meet with Buddha himself to retrieve some uh, scriptures and bring them back to China. And along the way, he's accompanied by uh, these disciples. You can see surrounding him, there's a pig man, a monkey man, a soldier, and, and someone who's been turned into a horse. This is a long story. But, um, but they, they have great adventures along the way. It's a lot of fun. If you want a long but, but very rewarding read, it's, it's a lot of fun. It, it reads kind of like a comic book. Every chapter, they meet with another group of monsters that they have to go beat up. And um, the monsters have this idea that the Buddhist monk, if they can um, eat his flesh, that they'll get some, some benefit from it. So um, the, the Buddhist monk is, is, is always being dangled over pots of boiling oil and something until the, the monkey comes in and smashes the, uh, the monsters with his staff. So it's, it's a lot of fun. But I'll, I'll, I'll say more about the significance beyond just the, the fighting scenes in a second. The other book that I read that I, I felt was really significant to the theme was Don Quixote. And I had, I had always wanted to read it. This was a great opportunity to do it. So two volumes, 800 pages or something. And of course, this is a story of the man of La Mancha, the, uh, the knight errant, or the man who believes he's a knight. Uh, so Don Quixote is, everyone knows the uh, tilting at windmills. And he did joust some windmills. But really, what's happening in the story is that Don Quixote believes, he has this crazy vision, that he is a medieval knight. And this is in early Renaissance. So it's, Spain is past the medieval ages. But he says, no, 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 I'm a medieval knight, and I'm going to bring back, I'm going to re-usher in the age of chivalry. And his friends are saying, Don Quixote, you're, you're, you're crazy. Put down the lance. Uh, come back and tend your garden or, or whatever. And he says, no, no, I'm a medieval knight. I'm a medieval knight. I'm going to bring back chivalry. And most chapters in Don Quixote uh, are stories of him getting beaten up. Um, it's, it's sort of amusing, actually, but it's kind of sad at the same time. So what were, some of the, what were some of the lessons that I pulled out of these two books? One from the Eastern canon, one from the Western canon, very different. I did the gel thing of looking for common patterns to try to uncover universal truths. And I, I, I on reflection, came up with three patterns that I noticed that may be instructive to you. I'm sure you would come up with even more patterns, but here's three that I came up with. And one is that journeys require commitment. And this probably is pretty obvious. I mean, you go on a journey, you're going to have to commit to it. But you know, we're, we're in a moment in society and culture where 
um, what's being offered us is ever faster and more distracting, and people are feeling anxious and overloaded, and it's difficult to um, ask for or hold people's attention for long stretches of time. And so things are, things are getting a little superficial in some ways. And these books remind us, know that if you want the authentic, meaningful experience that comes from a journey, you're going to have to commit to it. You're going to have to commit time. You're going to have to commit energy. You're going to have to be faithful through the distance until you achieve your goal. And that's something that flies in the face of uh, a lot of what's, what's happening in culture today. So I think this is a, a helpful counterpoint. And this, this theme, I think, is you're going to see it come up in other talks throughout the day. Second pattern, something that I hadn't really realized until I read the books, is that journeys are both outer and inner. And maybe you knew this already, but I, I didn't. I, I didn't realize that in any journey that's actually a journey, there's actually two parts. They're kind of mirror images of each other. There's an outer journey in the physical world, and then there's an inner journey that's emotional, spiritual, psychological. Um, if any of you know uh, or are familiar with the writings of Joseph Campbell, who wrote Hero of a Thousand Faces and uh, advised on the original Star Wars, he wrote about something called the hero's journey. I, I, I did some research online, and it turns out he found exactly the same thing. So this is definitely not my idea. It's been around for a while. So I found this on a site called The Writer's Journey. This is a diagram of how Joseph Campbell described the universal patterns of the outer journey of the hero. And you can see the hero leaves the ordinary world, crosses a threshold, meets enemies, uh, 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 finds the, the golden sword or elixir or whatever it is, and then returns home. At the same time, at exactly the same time of that outer journey, there's an inner journey. And this is where the hero has to overcome their resistance to change. They have to face their greatest fear. They have to accept the consequences of their decisions. And they have to make some uh, final uh, leap of uh, achieving mastery. And so these two uh, types of journeys, the outer and inner, go together. And I want to invite you to listen for that in the talks today to see if you can pull out uh, those, those two types of journeys that are happening simultaneously. Third and finally, maybe most importantly, journeys involve change. Another obvious statement. Uh, if, if a hero goes on a journey that uh, requires commitment, they put in the time and the energy and uh, have go through the, the, the hero cycle of both the outer and the inner journey, of course they're going to be changed. They're going to be permanently changed, probably for the better. Um, and I had some sense of that um, before I started reading. But what I, what I did not totally grasp um, until I read Journey to the West and Don Quixote is that it's not just the hero who's changed by the journey. See, uh, if the hero really goes the distance, it's not the hero himself or herself who's changed. It's the people around them as well. For example, in Don Quixote, as I said, the, during the whole story, both volumes, his friends are surrounding Don Quixote, trying to bring him back, saying, you're crazy. Give it up. Give it up. You're, you're insane. We need to cure you. And through his journey, somehow, miraculously, at the very end of the story, he's surrounded by his friends. And they say, we believe. You are a knight. You did usher back in the age of chivalry. Don't stop now. Keep going. And what I take from that, which again, I, I hope you'll see echoes of this in the talks today, is that if you go on a journey and go in the distance, you'll be changed, but so will the people around you. And if you're lucky, you might just change the world. So thanks for your attention.